want to talk to you about passing the faith. And when I talk about the faith, I'm not just talking about, um, you know, faith that God can do great things because we know God can do great things. But I'm talking about passing the faith, passing the, the instructions, the doctrine, the teaching, what you and I have been taught in the word of God to the next generation. How are we going to do that? And in the book of John, chapter 17, verse 14, Jesus says the following. John 17, 14. I have given them thy word. Listen to what Jesus says. I have given them thy word. And then he says, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I'm going to keep reading. Verse 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. And then he says, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And I love verse 17. Sanctify them. In other words, separate them. For what? Sanctify them through what? Through thy truth. And then he declares, thy word is truth. But I want to focus on the first few words in verse 14, where Jesus said, I have given them thy word. He didn't say, I've given them my own words. But he glorified the Father. He said, I have given them your words, Father. So, you know, it's very hard sometimes when, when we're asked to bring a message for Father's Day or for Mother's Day because not everybody's home situation is the same. And sometimes it's difficult. It's just difficult services to preach in. And however, there's one thing that we can all relate to, and that's God's Word. We can all relate to God's Word, the Bible. And regardless of whether we're a mother or a father or, or a guardian or, or simply a believer in Christ, the Bible speaks to us individually and mandates that we walk upright in the sight of God. So while the standards for living that apply specifically to fathers and to mothers, we can apply it to each and every one of us that are here in this morning. And as believers in Christ, our faith must be based on the Bible. You know, there was a young father who him and his wife had just had a baby. And she woke up, it was like three in the morning, and she woke up and she said, well, where is Jimmy at? She went, walked into the baby's room and Jimmy's right there looking at the crib. He's just looking at the crib, looking at the baby. And she said, wow, what a, what a husband that I have. What a father. He's just looking at the baby. And she could just, you know, she was swirled in with emotion. She got close to Jimmy. She said, Jimmy. What are you thinking, Jimmy? He said, I just can't believe how beautiful this $45 crib is. It's just so beautiful. <laughs> well, he was right. It was a nice crib. But she thought he was thinking about something else. Those are the, the type, you know, see, everybody laughed because if, if the young children were here or the young people, they would say, oh, it's a dad joke. And they wouldn't have laughed at all. That's why we have them in children's service. <laughs> but as I thought about it, I said, it's still true. And sometimes we, we think about these things in situations in life, but we go back to John 17 and we go back to the words of Jesus where he says, I have given them thy word. Now, when Jesus said, I've given them thy word, he also was saying, I have put upon them the word. And we'll know why he's saying this. Why? Because, you know, we read the Bible sometimes and we read it in our own language in English and we automatically think that that's what the Bible means. But the Bible comes from this language of Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and, and we have to delve into the Word of God to really understand what the writer is trying to tell us here. So when we see the words, I've given them thy word, we, we automatically think because of the English language that Jesus, in other words, just transferred over the Word of God to them. But in, in the Greek, he's saying, not, I have not only given it to them, but I have placed the word of God on them. Now, 
When we begin to understand these words in this manner, then everything we begin to read in the Bible, all of God's Word becomes very more clearly understood for us when we begin to understand. So listen to this. The word, I have given. That word in Greek means to give, to grant, to put on, to show, to deliver, and to make. It's a whole set of, uh, of different meanings for one word in Greek. You know, we were in Israel, and we, our, our guy, he, he was an Argentinian Israelite. And he spoke English, Spanish, and Hebrew. But his main language was Hebrew, and Spanish was like his third language. And he would get up there, and he would begin to explain things. He would say, well, this is the mountain where Moses is buried, and this is where he looked at the promised land. And he would say, how do you say that in Spanish? Was the worst mistake he could do was ask a question, how do you say that in Spanish, when you had a mixture of different people from different places around the world in Spanish. And someone said, well, this is how you say it. Oh, no, well, this is how you say it. And he said, oh, you guys are crazy. Everybody has their own definition of how to say a word in Spanish. Because Spanish, the general Spanish, yes, comes from Spain, but there's different types of Spanish. I came to Tennessee, I didn't know there was, uh, 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 what is it, Appalachian Mountain type of Sp uh, uh, English? We had to translate from, from country to English and into Spanish. It's all these different types of words. I never heard of the word, um, um, what do you, you make this, what do they say? A hobby horse. You make that a hobby horse. I, how do you translate hobby horse into Spanish? So you see here, Jesus is saying, I've given them that word. I've given it to them. I've granted it on them. I put it on them. I showed it to them. I delivered it to them. I made it known to them. So he's given us a clear definition that, he, that Jesus is teaching us that passing the faith on to the next generation, it's not only about teaching them the words of the Bible, but it's also about demonstrating the Bible's truth through our lives. How am I going to demonstrate this? It's about sharing the Word of God through our testimonies, through our words. Our sister says something so important in Sunday school. When you promise a child something, they will not forget it. And they'll keep nagging and nagging it until you fulfill that promise. And God has promised us in His Word. Now, Jesus declares, I have given them thy word, can also be used as I gave this word to them. So this, this term in Greek is a, uh, is a term that we would use in English as a past tense. When he says, I have given them, I gave them the word. But one of the unique features of this word, and, and I, wanna, I want you to understand this, is that when we use this word, it describes a past event. But in the Greek, it also describes an ongoing, significant event that continues to develop. So in other words, Jesus is saying, not only did I give them the word, but now that they have it, now that they've put it on, they continue to grow in your word. So it just doesn't stop at one point. It doesn't stop at the moment that I'm saved and that's it. No, I have to continue to persevere in the word. I have to continue to grow in the word. So as we're passing this on to the next generation, as fathers, as mothers, as, as guardians, the children see us, the youth see us, the people around us see us, that it is an ongoing process to continue to grow in God. So he says, I've given them thy word, I have put it on them, and they have it, but they're continuing to move forward with it. Isn't that beautiful? So we, we can extract all of this from a few words. This is why when you read the Scriptures, just, just don't read the Scriptures and say, well, I have given them that word, and they're not of this world. Oh, well, that's it. No, there's more to that. There's a reason there's a comma in there. There's a reason that Jesus, or that God has allowed for these words to be preserved for us today. There's a reason. You know, as we were in Israel walking around and we're looking at, at, at the condition of many I ask myself, how can they not see that Jesus fulfilled all that requires to be the Messiah? How can they not see that? And then you begin to think, thank you, God, that you revealed to us Jesus. Huh? 
Can't you just thank God for that? Thank you, God, that you reveal Jesus. When he says to Peter, Peter, I know who you are and you know who I am. He's trying to tell Peter, you know what my mission is. You understand who I am. And upon this rock, this understanding of who you are and you know that I am, you know my mission, nothing can move the church because she understands God's work and God's mission. So, the significance. So not only did Jesus say, I have given them thy word, but that the word was imparted to the apostles, then to the church, and guess what? It's been passed on to us today. Now, what does that tell us about words? That words have a long-lasting effect, correct? Positive words. They can uplift somebody and encourage people, correct? They can build self-confidence and self-esteem in a person. It's true. They can inspire and motivate people to achieve their goals. They can help build and trust uh, in relationships and strengthen relationships. Those are positive words. They can bring joy and happiness in people's lives. They can heal emotional wounds. You've been in a situation where somebody comes and gives you, just tells you a word, and that just kind of like begins the healing process. It can promote forgiveness. And they can express love and affection and strengthen the bond between people. Those are positive words, but also negative words. They can hurt and damage people emotionally. That's true. They can create division and conflict between people. They can discourage and demotivate people. That's true. Negative words can lead to misunderstandings and miscommunication. Incite anger and hatred, promote harmful behaviors and attitudes, and they can also be used to manipulate people. Those examples demonstrate the power of words and the importance of using them carefully and intentionally. But words have the ability to also shape our thoughts, our feelings, our actions, and it can have, have a profound impact on our lives and those around us. But what does Jesus say in John 17, 14? I have given them whose words? His words. I'm not trying to take away from Jesus here. Because Jesus is God. I'm not trying to take away from His power. But as the Son of Man, He is trying to tell us, hey, I have a mission. And my mission is to impart His words to you. So when the preacher stands up here in the front, you know, one of my greatest pet peeves, and I'll share it with you, is to have somebody preach and get up here and just talk about their life and their opinions and their ideas, and I did this and I did that, and never truly focus on the Word of God. I'm not saying that it's, it, you can share those things. It's beautiful. You can, but the main purpose of being up here is for you to understand God's word. How can I apply this word to my life? How can I grow in this word? And what does it say Jesus taught? That he said that the words that he gave came directly from the Father. Then Jesus said unto them, listen to what John 8, 28 says. When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. And then I love what Jesus says here. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? As my Father has taught me. So we're talking about passing this faith to the next generation. Passing this. So in other words, we're not passing our opinions. We're not passing our ideas. What we're trying to do here is pass on what has already been established in God's Word to the children, to the youth, to our family, and tell them, hey, this is what God's Word says. It is said of our first general overseer, A.J. Tomlinson, that when people would come to him and say, I have this problem, the first thing he would say, he would say, well, let's go to the Bible. And see what the Bible says. <laughs> Let's see what the Bible says. Instead of the moment, you know, where we're human, at the moment we want to impart our own thoughts and our ideas into a situation and counsel right away. But what if we would just stop for a minute and say, wait a minute, let's see what the Bible says. 
What does God's Word say? And he says, my Father has taught me I speak these things. So in this passage, Jesus is telling the Jewish teachers and leaders that his teachings and his actions are not of his own, but come from the Father. He emphasizes that he is not acting independently, but he's speaking only what the Father has taught him. There's unity when the words that we pass on to the next generation are not our own opinions. When they come to us for counseling, when they see what comes out of our mouths, when they see our testimony, and I'm not, you know, we're going to make mistakes. Yes, we're going to make mistakes. But we can own up to the, as a father, I make mistakes. And you know what I do? I apologize to my children. And I sit down and say, look, I should have not acted that way. I was frustrated and I'm sorry. And we make it right. What does that do to them? That teaches them something. Not only helps them, but it helps me because you know what? They have a soul. And one day they're going to face God by themselves without mommy or daddy right next to them. And it's better be that I am shaping them in God's word and not in my opinions and my ideas. Yes, I may have personal convictions, but they better align to the word of God. Now, Jesus is telling them here. So in other words, there is unity when the words that we pass on to the next generation are not our own opinions, our thought, or ideas, but are what? Are based upon the Word of God. We'll never go wrong when we base everything on God's Word. Amen? Jesus was demonstrating that it takes unity within the Word of God to pass this faith to the next generation. Now, Paul once said about the faith, he said, the same faith that I persecuted. Remember when Paul said, this is the same faith I persecuted. And then in Galatians, Paul mentions that he persecuted the church. So in other words, Paul was relating the church with the faith, and he was calling the church the faith. And he was saying, I persecuted the faith. In other words, the, the message of the body of Christ. So this is what we're passing on to the next generation. That God has a program to gather all His children into one. How's He going to do it? I don't know. I don't know. It's, it, we, we were in Jerusalem and we had a worship time and there was 30 uh, leaders from the United States, Hispanic leaders there from all different sorts of denominations. You had Holiness, Pentecostal, uh, Baptist, and we got to praying and God's power fell in that place. And you just felt God's power. And at that moment, I told my wife, I didn't feel as if we were all divided by denominations. It felt like God's love was in that place. And Brother Bobby, I said, I don't know how God's going to do it, but he's going to get us together. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to, if he says it in his word, that he will gather his children in one, then he will fulfill his word. And it felt so beautiful to be there with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, if we would have thought theology, then we might have, we would have left there crazy. <laughs> and I'm not saying that we're going to put that to the side. No, God's going to take care of that also. He's going to bring us into one accord in theology, in doctrine, in understanding. But what is he saying? Stick to my word. Jesus, at the moment that he says, I have given them thy word, that's an example for us to say, wait a minute, if Jesus could declare that, then we could also do the same today to give thy word to everybody else. Now, John, 14, John 12, 49 says, again, Jesus, for I have not spoken of myself. Listen to what Jesus is saying. But the Father which sent me, what did he do? He gave me a commandment. What I should say and what I should speak. <laughs> what other proof do we need? What other understanding can we, can we glean from this? The moment Jesus says, look, 
The Father told me what I should say and what I should speak. Shouldn't that be the same calling for the church today also? That the church could declare collectively what we say is what the Father has told us through the Word and what we speak is what we find in God's Word and nothing else. That's it. Only the Word of God. Now, Jesus emphasizes here that His words and His teachings come from the Father. And that He is simply relying on what He has been commanded to say. And it highlights, listen to this, the unity and cooperation between the Father and the Son and now the Holy Ghost in the work that we're doing today. We see it here. What, is it, what does it say when Jesus says, what I should say and what I should speak? He's saying, hey, we're in unity. We're united. We're not separate in our thoughts. We're not separate in our understanding. But it takes a divine unity for us to even declare this today. It's going to take God's divine power for us collectively to be in one accord, to be in one mind, to think the same way, to, to finish each other's sentences. It's not going to take your power or my power. It's going to take you and I surrendering to the power of God, surrendering to His guidance to mold us in one. And what does that do? That passes this faith to the next generation. Because when they see it, and they see that we're striving towards it, they'll come right behind us and say, we're going to help you strive for it. You know, all these different ages went with us in this tour. And there was an older sister. And we didn't want nobody to stay behind in our group, especially in these foreign countries. And you know what some of the sisters would do? They'd push her along. We'd go up the stairs and they're pushing her up the stairs. We're not leaving you behind, sister. And they'd push her here and they'd push her there. And she even testified crying. She said, I've never seen so many people willing to help me. Nobody wanted to leave her behind. Now, what if we did that in the church? <laughs> what if we did that with one another? We see the brother and the sister down. Yeah, I feel God just saying that. You know, you see the brother, you push them. And, and, and just show that I'm here to help. I, it don't matter if I'm getting hurt. It don't matter if I'm tired. I want you to make heaven just the way I want to make heaven. And we push each other. The next generation is going to see that. And they're going to be encouraged. And when they see somebody down, they're going to go behind. They're going to say, I'm going to do it just like grandma did it. I'm going to push and help her. I'm going to do it just like grandpa did it. I'm going to go over there and pray for them. I'll do it. Because that's the standard that we're set. We have to set the standard high. Real high. For them to see that in us. Again, I'm not saying that we're perfect. We're going to make mistakes. Yes. But what I'm saying is that we're striving to persevere until the end. And listen, it highlights the unity and cooperation between God the Father. Now, overall, Jesus' statement about the source of His words and His teachings, what does it demonstrate to us? His submission to the Father and to reliance on His divine guidance. Again. We cannot stop emphasizing this again, what Jesus is saying here. I need God's guidance in every single aspect of my life. It doesn't matter how many years I've been in this walk of faith, the devil is going to try to destroy you. It don't matter. That's his goal is to destroy us from making heaven. Stop us from making heaven. But if we continue to rely on the divine guidance of who? Of God. Through the Holy Ghost. And when we're down, we, we look to Him and we say, God, cheer me up, encourage me, get into the Word, and God will give you the guidance you need. Because Jesus said that He's given us whose words? The words of the Father. And what happens when we pass the word on to the next generation? Look at, look at what it says here. The world has hated them. It's not so much that the world hates us. Listen to this. But that it hates us because we identify with Jesus. That's why it hates us. 
Because we identify with the Messiah. We identify with the one that has fulfilled the word. This is why the world hates us. This is why the next generation needs to understand that they will be hated for their stance in the fundamentals of the truth of the gospel message. It's not going to get any better. But with Jesus, we have the strength to overcome it all. If we can show them today that we can stand for the truth, no matter what, that will set the standard for our children, for the youth, for all those in the church. They're going to see we're willing to stand. It don't matter how many friends and family we lose for the stance of the gospel message. We're standing for the word. I'm not talking about being mean. No, I'm talking about just standing for the fundamentals of the truth of the word of God. You know, we're living in a time today that a lot of Christian organizations today are not even teaching salvation the way it's supposed to be taught. You know, we celebrated Shabbat with the Jewish family, and I had a conversation with, the, with a few uh, uh, pastors there. And, and the worst thing you can do is get into politics or theology. And we started talking about the basics of salvation. And I, I, was, I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I said, I don't believe that. I don't, I, I, I don't believe what you're saying. The Bible don't teach it this way. You know, we ended up good. We had a good conversation. But I, was, I, I just said, Lord, I can't believe this. It goes back to what we're saying here. The world have hated them because they are not of the world. Listen to what he's saying. On another occasion, Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before hating you. So the statement is given to the disciples when he said this. He said this to them the night before he's going to be crucified. He said to them, look, if, they hate, they're, if they're going to hate you, they're going to hate me. They hated me way before. Jesus is preparing his disciples for what is to come. And he's warning them that the world would hate them because they belong to him. Are we seeing this today? <laughs> I think we're seeing this today more than we've ever seen it before. And because of the media and communications we have, we see it daily. It's, it's a sad situation. So this is why Peter once said, listen to what Peter said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. It's not strange. It's not a strange thing that we're going to go through these trials. But what are we sticking to? The words of Jesus, which are who? The, the words of the Father. If I stick to the words of Jesus, I'm connected to the Father. You know, we're connected to the Holy Ghost and into the Son and into the Father. We're all three connected. And then he says, they're not of this world because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So when we pass our faith to the next generation, what are we telling them? That we're not of this world. What does that mean? It simply means that our identity and I want you to listen to this. And our alliance are not rooted in the values and priorities of this world. Our values are not rooted in the priorities of, uh, of this world. No, Jesus has set us apart for, from this world and its ways. So the tension arises then because the values that you and I uphold come from the word of God. And these values conflict with those values of the world today. We are called to live in the world, but not be of the world. We should identify with Jesus' teachings instead of conforming to the patterns of the world. You know, it was a hard conversation with those pastors. When all, three, when all four of them were against what I was saying. And it's hard to stand firm. You know, they celebrated Shabbat and, and, and all they had was water and wine. But we stood up and we said, we don't drink this. I don't, you know, I don't drink wine or beer, none of that. And when he said, who wants grape juice? I raised my hand. <laughs> it was probably just me and my wife. <laughs> but we stood for the word. No church member was there. Nobody was watching us. But what? We had been taught the fundamentals of the faith. 
He was watching. Amen. And sometimes you may be the outcast in all the group, but you're standing for the word. I love that song. Heaven will surely be worth it all. Won't it be worth it all? I told somebody, I don't care if they roll me into heaven. Just roll me in there. As long as I made it. Huh? As long as I made it. Now, the faith we pass on to our children, to the next generation, guess what it's going to be? It's going to be counter-cultural. It is. And it's already counter-cultural. You know, we could stand up here and we can talk about just our country in the United States, what we're going through. Other countries are going through similar things. But to see the United States, and I, I don't want to get political. I don't, I'm not going to get into none of that. But what I'm saying is to see um, not just our country, but this world begin to go more deeper and deeper into darkness is a sad situation. Where we were called to send out missionaries, now it seems like we need missionaries to come to our country and to get people saved. So it's counterculture. We must teach the next generation not to be swayed by the values and priorities of this world. No. But to seek to live in a way that reflects what? The values of God's word. We can do it. You know, sometimes we, we look at our numbers and we think we can't do it. We can do it. God is with us. And if he's with us, nothing can stop us. We have to teach them to, listen to this, to find their identity in who? In Christ. What do we have today? An identity crisis. Find their identity in Christ, not in the world, and to be rooted in Him. They should not conform to the patterns of this world, but to those found in God's Word. But where does it begin? Everybody, let me see your thumbs. Everybody give me two thumbs up. Where does it begin? Look, point it this way. <laughs> right here with me. It begins with me. So overall, the passing of the faith to the next generation is not an individual, but it's a collective thing. By each person in the family contributing to their own unique way, the next generation can be equipped and empowered to live out their faith in this world. It's so important to us. Sister Lisa, if you can help us. I want to sing that song one more time. I surrender all. So important to us. You say, well, was this a Father's Day message? Yeah, it was a, it was a message for all of us. Because <laughs> some mothers are fathers. Because they're doing the two. They're doing the job of the two of them. And some fathers are also doing the job of a mother. It's a hard situation. This is the world that we live in today. But guess what? I can do all things through who? Through Christ. So I want you to rise with us in this morning.